Hey there, everyone. Today, I want to look at Je Deleuze's essay, Eminence, A Life. This is one of the last works that Deleuze ever published, and it's very short. It's only seven pages, probably less if the, um, if the typeset was bigger. Um, I'll leave a link to this particular volume where you can find this essay. Uh, it's in Pure Eminence, Essays on a Life from Zone Books. And I think this is a really good essay for understanding particularly some of the Nietzschean influence on Deleuze. Because while Nietzsche is never explicitly recognized in this particular essay, it's clear that Deleuze is taking from Nietzsche a sort of happy nihilism, a way of looking at life that doesn't become optimist in the sense of going over life in the direction of transcendence, but it also doesn't reduce life to pure subjective material, you know, like, I'm just a brain and that's it. There's a sort of middle ground that Deleuze is trying to straddle here, and it's very interesting because I think it's important to understand this essay, to understand the difference between transcendence and imminence. Now, if I say a threat is imminent, it means that it is a real challenge that I'm facing in the here and now. It somehow is directly impeding on me existentially. Maybe this is an imminent threat of occupation or of war or of me losing my job or something like that. So an imminent threat is defined by being connected to my life, but also it goes beyond my life. It's not just reducible to how it impacts me, but it's a particularly imminent threat the more it threatens my entire transcendental field. And that transcendental field we will explain more as we get into this essay. And if we want to understand why Deleuze is so insistent on imminence and pure imminence at that, we have to understand what it means to talk about something transcendent. Now, the perfect example of something transcendent would be God. And something that you know, defines a transcendent thing is it operates on a different metaphysical or ontological plane from the one that we live on. So there's kind of human existence and life, and then there's a transcendent, separate realm. Maybe this is Plato's realm where the forms live. So the realm in which lives pure whiteness as such, or pure purpleness, or pure softness, or pure hardness, or justice in and of itself. For Plato, these are forms, and these are transcendent things, that allow us to understand how we're actually able to talk about things as existing here in our lives imminently. So when I say something is black, Plato would say, well, when you talk about something in your life as being black, it is predicated by a number of other properties, right? A thing isn't just black, it's also hard or soft or it has a number of other properties that qualify the blackness, such that you never experience blackness as such. You experience blackness in a particular object, in a particular circumstance. And Plato says the only reason you can talk about blackness in different circumstances, since technically it's a slightly different blackness each time, you know, you view it I don't know, maybe there's some black object and you view it at night and then you view it in the day. Technically, it's the same object, but you experience that object differently, yet somehow you can recognize it as the same. And Plato says this is because of the existence of transcendent forms. And these transcendent forms exist unpredicated in a realm of their own. 
And in the same way, people like to talk about God, and they say that God is, for example, beyond space and time, and thus he can structure space and time, or he can structure the world, because he's outside of it. Now, this has a number of problems for Deleuze, and it kind of replicates problems that he has with um, the natural sciences and logic to certain extents, as you can see in what is philosophy, for example, where these are abstractions. They're general in a way that is unhelpful for understanding our lives because it doesn't actually have an imminent relation to our lives. It's a way to cope with our imminent circumstances by inventing a new realm. And this is, of course, very similar to Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche mentions that people who are struggling with their life circumstances, struggling with um, a feeling of their actions being base or something, or being unable to cope with their circumstances, will go to religion, for example, in order to make their baselessness feel like some eternal condition, namely being in a state of original sin that one needs to, you know, needs to have atoned. So one turns one's temporary imminent struggles into an eternal struggle in a way that validates it and thus makes it tolerable, makes it livable. So even for Nietzsche, the existence and creation of transcendence is a product of imminence. It is a product of struggling with real circumstances on earth. And when Ludwig Feuerbach takes up, for example, religious philosophy, he says, okay, you religious people will go past all these arguments that I've been talking about in, for example, The Essence of Religion, which is a very short, very, um, very good book. He says, okay, you religious people will talk about divine revelation. You'll say that you know God and you know which God is the correct one because of divine revelation. And he's like, okay, let's grant for a second that such a being exists, such a transcendent being who exists on a different realm than us humans do. And all of his actions, all of his ways are higher, as it says in the Bible, for example. Feuerbach says, nevertheless, when a divine revelation comes, you don't experience that revelation as transcendent. You experience it as imminent, namely imminent to your language, to your ability to understand. Even if God's ways are higher, Feuerbach says, even if such a God exists, you never, of course, are able to understand those higher ways. You are never able to have a genuinely divine revelation you are able to have a human vision or interpretation of a divine revelation. And as such, Feuerbach says, you know, postulating this transcendent realm is a rather vapid exercise because we don't actually experience transcendence ever. We can postulate it and talk about it, but what we experience are imminent affects, feelings, sensations, events in our lives, feelings, beliefs, all of these things are imminent. And even if you want to say they're divine revelation, Feuerbach says that this points more to the struggles and need to focus on the imminent life here and now rather than abstracting to a transcendent life. So, given all these preliminary discussions of the difference between transcendence and imminence, hopefully we, will, hopefully we will be better able to understand the difference between those terms as it's used in this essay.
Now, the terms eminence and a life are intimately connected in this essay. Deleuze opens by talking about a transcendental field. And the transcendental and the transcendent are different. And this is something you would get if you um, read any Kant, which Deleuze is heavily influenced by Kant. The transcendental field is defined by Deleuze as a pure stream of a subjective consciousness, a pre-reflexive, impersonal consciousness, a qualitative duration of consciousness without a self. He says, for sensation is only a break within the flow of absolute consciousness. It is rather, however close two sensations may be, the passage from one to the other as becoming, as increase or decrease in power, virtual quantity. So a life, and a life which is defined by imminence, is defined not by being reduced to a subject. And this is a continuous contention of Deleuze with, for example, Descartes. Now, Descartes talks about the cogito, the thinking thing. And the cogito grounds Descartes' ontology because Descartes goes through this philosophy of doubt where he says, okay, my experience, my perception is marred by subjectivity, by the fact that I am limited in my understanding of the world by my subjective interpretation of, you know, whether this is Feuerbach's divine revelation, whether this is my perception of objects that I see, whether this is my perception of the emotions of others. It's always marred by the fact that I don't necessarily experience these things in and of themselves, but rather I experience them as marred by my own subjectivity. So Descartes wants to find something that he can go without having the possibility to doubt. And the one thing that he cannot doubt is that he is thinking, because thinking is a form of doubting. So he says the one thing he can know for certain about himself, because even the perception of his own, you know, just looking down and looking at his appendages and his body parts, the one thing he knows about himself that he can know simply because it is impossible to doubt, is that he is a thinking thing, a cogito. Now, the stability of this cogito is taken for granted by Descartes. Descartes assumes that the cogito is something eternal, in a sense, something that has an enduring being that is able to withstand changes coming from the world. And this leads Descartes to a problematic subject-object dualism, where you have the subject, that being the thinking thing, the cogito, and then you have the objects of that subject, namely the rest of the world. And this creates a rather problematic scene for Descartes, where he has to say, okay, well, now that I've got the cogito, how do I get to the rest of the world? And Descartes grounds this in God, in the transcendent, in order to help explain the security of his existence, of his life. Instead of looking at the imminent things in his life which structure his transcendental field, that selfhood that goes beyond the merely subjective thing that is mine, the experiences that point outside of me, Instead, Descartes gets stuck in the cogito and gets stuck in this need for transcendence, in this need to postulate something to save him. So he postulates, namely, the Christian God, which he mentions is going to ensure him that the world that he sees is relatively similar to the way it actually is because God wouldn't want to deceive him because God loves him. So using this definition of God, Descartes grounds himself in a subjectivity that arguably doesn't help one actually understand the world that forces one to go beyond oneself, 
but only allows oneself to cement oneself in a notion of subjectivity, of something that's mine, of something that is irreducibly unchangeable. But for Deleuze, what defines a transcendental field is that it is this stream of flows, of experiences, affects, emotions, which occur without our needing to reflect on them, right? They come from beyond us, and they prompt a becoming, an increase or decrease in power. So they affect us like, a, I don't know, like a transistor gets affected by an electrical current. He writes that absolute immanence is in itself. It is not in something, to something. It does not depend on an object or belong to a subject. So the life that one lives is, of course, imminent, imminent to one's subjective understanding of the world. But for Deleuze, this doesn't make the world any less important or any less real. In fact, this is the only reality we have. One of Deleuze's most important points, and maybe we could call it a presupposition, but I would say a well-founded one, is that imminence is all we have. That transcendence might be useful, but just like Feuerbach wants to understand the essence of religion as reflecting an imminent desire to better humankind, to struggle with imminent things in the world and as such create this transcendent world, Deleuze understands that the imminence of a life is something unique to the here and now, to the becomings that are forcing one to be something that they're not right now. He writes, imminence is not related to some thing, and that's with a capital S and a capital T, as a unity superior to all things, or to a subject as an act that brings about a synthesis of things. It is only when imminence is no longer imminence to anything other than itself that we can speak of a plane of imminence. And this plane of imminence can be thought of as events, affects, things that go outside of being reduced to my 9-11, for example. 9-11 goes beyond any one person. It's an event. It's not merely a moment in history, some logically exhaustible event that we can write about. No. It trickles down and out to affect the lives of people in the here and now. It affects their sense of security in a country that previously had felt itself as an immovable superpower. So the imminence of 9-11 is not related to some unity of myself that helps me understand 9-11, because 9-11 breaks me apart. 9-11 forces one to change. It forced the entire country to change, for example, in the way we operate airport security. It's difficult for many people born after 2001, like myself, to imagine what a world would be like with anything less than the level of stringent airport security we have today in the U.S. as a result of 9-11. In any of these other events, maybe it's the Israeli occupation and genocide in Palestine. This is an imminent event which obviously forces the Palestinians and even the people watching the event to change. It breaks apart the supposed security of the thinking thing, the thing that just gets to sit back in his armchair and look at the world. No, it forces one to fall apart and to understand the world anew in a transcendental field which goes beyond me. And I think this is what helps make Deleuze so interesting, 
is that he help, he helps us actually understand life in a way that allows us to be sensitive to others, to difference, to variation, and to change, instead of to what we see as the stability that grounds us. He says, we will say of pure eminence that it is a life in all caps and nothing else. It is not eminence to life, but the imminent that is nothing is itself a life. A life is the imminence of imminence, absolute imminence. It is complete power, complete bliss. It is to the degree that he goes beyond the aporias of the subject and the object that Johann Fichte, in his last philosophy, presents the transcendental field as a life, no longer dependent on a being or submitted to an act. It is an absolute immediate consciousness whose very activity no longer refers to a being, but is ceaselessly posed in a life. So the notion of a life is really important in Deleuze because it is indefinite. It is not the life or my life. It is not a prefigured life to which one inhabits, but rather it's something continually under construction. And this is why Deleuze breaks with the traditional determinist conception of causality, for example. Certain determinists, for example, will say that your, everything that you will ever do is predetermined in advance because everything is material, or at the very least, that everything interacts causally which is to say everything that happens is caused by something which preceded it. And because everything has a definite duration and place in space and time, everything will have a one-to-one -one correspondence with what it causes. So, for example, my choice to want chocolate ice cream more than vanilla is caused by a sequence of neurotransmitters and electrical signals in my brain out of my control, which themselves were caused by other interactions of physical particles and various material things interacting with each other. And on this determinist account, if you knew the position, the speed, the properties of any physical system at any point in time, you could know with 100% certainty the outcome of that system up to infinity, for forever. But Deleuze challenges this because he says that this is predicated on self-contained ontology. Just in the case of a human life, which is in fact not this stable fully logically accountable thing, right? It comes from beyond. It is predicated on a past of memories. It's predicated on aspirations in the future, which have not even occurred yet, which retroactively come back and change the way one is acting in the here and now. In the same way, the whole universe is beholden to events which go beyond pure causal understanding. If you want to understand this better, I did a lecture on Deleuze and Guattari's May 68 did not take place, in which they look at the French uprisings and protests of May 68 in France, and they counter the notion that it is this historically accountable thing that took place as a definite moment in history. They say that there's something indefinite, something very similar to a life. It is a, an event that goes beyond being logically reduced and instead has precedent before and after that trickle out beyond the immediate existence or being of May 68. So in the same way, a life 
necessarily goes beyond myself, goes beyond being absolutely determined, and instead refers to a being which is constantly in question, which is constantly problematized, and as such needs to be created in the here and now. He asks, what is imminence? In his response, a life with ellipses. And from this moment on out, a life is always followed by ellipses. Precisely because, just like a life is connected to an imminent here and now, it is also connected to a transcendental future and a past. Just like memories no longer exist, technically, insofar as they happened at one point in time but are no longer happening, and just as the future has not yet happened, both of these still structure a life here and now. Past traumas influence my life in a way in which I can't, I can't hope to be a sort of passive, objective observer of, for example, my subjectivity, like for Descartes. I'm not just this innocent thinking theme. I'm assailed by things which come from the outside and force me to be other than I am. Deleuze writes, The life of the individual gives way to an impersonal and yet singular life that releases a pure event freed from the accidents of internal and external life, that is, from the subjectivity and objectivity of what happens. So, right, there's a, there's a sense in which what happens is created by individual subjects in a way in which it is structured and defined by particular persons, but one of the things that defines a life and which allows for solidarity, not only within the individual that is living that life, but in the society that shares the implications of that life, is that a life is impersonal. It has the ability to have a sort of zone of indiscernibility around it, a zone of confluence, as Deleuze calls it. Which is to say, something that goes beyond the self, which allows for some interaction between people. And this is precisely what imminence does. Because imminent things like a life don't have this boxed-in territory, they have fuzzy edges, they have dotted lines instead of solid lines, because there's something ambiguous about it, it has the potential to reach beyond itself to become something it's not, precisely because what it is is defined by what it has been, what it is yet to be, and particularly what it is yet to be is a creative process of change, of creation, in the here and now, structured by something which has never existed. Now, it's important to contextualize this within Deleuze's philosophy in general. And a life bears a lot of similarities to the assemblage in general, which is a big topic in Deleuze and Guattari's philosophy. And in Manuel de Landa's book, Deleuze, History and Science, he gives us a definition of an assemblage which helps us understand what it means for life to be imminence. And any time I use the word assemblage, you could imagine replacing it with the phrase a life. Delanda writes on page 84 and 85, the minimal definition of the term assemblage, or a life, is that of a whole with properties that are both irreducible and imminent. An assemblage, or life's properties, are irreducible because while they emerge from the actual interaction between its parts, they cannot be ascribed to any of its parts. And they are imminent because if the components of the assemblage, or the life, 
ceased to interact, its own properties would cease to exist. So, right, a life, just like an assemblage, requires the existence of a bunch of moving parts, memories, world events, actions one is, you know, embarking on. And all of these things define a life. But one's life is also more than one's actions. For example, one's life is defined by the kinds of things you would see in an obituary, by their legacy. That's a perfect example because one's legacy, of course, is, you know, it is imminently defined by the actions that that person undertook. It's dependent upon or contingent upon those actions, right? Were they a good person in their life? What were the kind of things they did in their profession? How did they treat their family? But all of these things get aggregated in a way in which a life is irreducible to the parts that make up the life. My life, for example, is a conglomeration of my actions in a way that creates Gavin, which is not my actions, but it is the result of my actions. But this doesn't mean that the actions, of course, are unnecessary. In fact, the existence of a life is predicated upon events that were actually lived. So it's, again, this sort of two-way mix between going over a person through transcendence and going under them by reducing them to just a material dead thing. And as such, Deleuze writes, it even seems that a singular life may do without any individuality, without any other concomitant that individualizes it. For example, very small children all resemble one another and have hardly any individuality. But they have singularities, a smile, a gesture, a funny face, not subjective qualities. Small children, through all their sufferings and weaknesses, are infused with an imminent life that is pure power and even bliss. And we have to be careful how we read this, because Deleuze is not saying that all children are the same thing. Obviously, he's not saying that. They are individual, different children. But what he's saying is, because children are in their infancy, because they are just developing their own subjectivity, what it means to be themselves, what it means to be a subject interacting with the world, There's a lot that is yet to be constructed, and as such, there's room for the ambiguity of actions like a smile or a gesture or a funny face, and also the integration and use of these actions, these singularities, as Deleuze calls them, in a way which allows us to elevate life to a whole new level of power and bliss. I think of how a child can go into a sort of autopilot, losing their attachment to their particular subjectivity, to their selfhood, as they play a playground game like Cops and Robbers, or they play a game like Family, where you know you pretend, oh, I'm a dad, and you're a mom, and you're a kid, and you're a dog, or whatever, and you, you just pretend like you're a family. And kids have a unique ability to pretend to immerse themselves in a life. Not my life, but a life, namely the life of the character that I come up with. Something imminent, yet tenuous, that can be punctuated by the demands or accidents of real life, such as recess being over or dinner's ready. So the existence in living of a life is tenuous. But in fact, when we look at the image of the child, we understand much better the ability of a truly imminent life to provide us with a sort of vitality that a lot of us feel like we might be missing. Deleuze writes, 
a life contains only virtuals. It is made up of virtualities, events, singularities. What we call virtual is not something that lacks reality, but something that is engaged in a process of actualization, following the plane that gives it its particular reality. The imminent event is actualized in a state of things and of the lived that make it happen. The plane of imminence is itself actualized in an object and a subject to which it attributes itself. But however inseparable an object and a subject may be from their actualization, the plane of imminence is itself virtual, so long as the events that populate it are virtualities. So, imagine, for example, the playground games that we've talked about before. The virtuality of the roles, the rules, the characters of the game, they are conditioned by the individuality of each kid that constructs them, right? They have something to do with, oh, I find Sally is my love interest, so I'm going to play family with her, and she's going to be the mom. So I get to play out this fantasy of, you know, us being married or whatever. But by constructing these games and entering into this intensive play with one another, this imminent life, and this life that goes beyond my own individuality, that brings me into the reality of a character which I have realized, which I have actualized through the plane of imminence, namely the virtual plane from which these characters are coming, I'm able to actually turn Sally into my wife, for example, in this situation. I am actually able to interact with someone in a living and breathing way, not reducible to a fantasy, because if you've ever been a kid and played a game, you can really get into these games to the extent to which you really lose yourself until, you know, the bell rings and you have to go back to class after recess, for example. So even though all these roles and characters and rules, even though all of these are conditioned by the subject that actualizes them, by the kid that actually plays the game, there's an irreducibly new and creative part of the game that actualizes a becoming. For example, personal growth. Maybe it allows me to be more comfortable in understanding the kind of husband I want to be. Even from a young age, kids can do this. Maybe this is how I like to love other people, how I'm allowed to touch other people, because maybe you play cops and robbers and you hit a kid, or you bump into them too hard and you get in trouble. So the ability to immerse oneself in these games, which may nevertheless allow for grave consequences, the imminent becoming becomes life itself. Personal growth becomes a lived experience. Thus, Deleuze concludes, the event considered as non-actualized or indefinite is lacking in nothing. It suffices to put in relation to its concomitants, a transcendental field, a plane of eminence, a life, singularities. So a life allows us to put into play virtualities, things which, quote-unquote, don't exist, but things which become my imminent concern, my imminent reality, when I realize them, when I reify them through actions. So I hope this has been helpful in understanding what Deleuze means by imminence, his critiques of transcendence, and the positive and affirmative quality of Deleuze's entire philosophy, even at the very conclusion of his life, just before his suicide, jumping out of a window. Check out any of my other lectures that I've done on Deleuze, Guattari, other postmodernists, German idealists, gender theorists, and other literature. Become a channel member for $5 a month and gain access to, among other things, a private philosophy Zoom that you can tailor to your needs. Maybe you need help reading some Deleuze or you want to talk about some problem. 
check out any of my other content, and I'll see you in another lecture.